Hi, everyone. Today we're going to talk about tools. But first, let me tell you about my dad. My dad was a tool maker. And what that meant in his context was he worked in a machine shop. And um, he went to school for an extra year to learn some advanced techniques so that he could make tools. The tools he made were used to make parts or make it easier to make parts that any other machinist could make. And uh, there was two reasons why he was called a toolmaker as opposed to just a machinist. First was that he just went to school for an extra year and learned some things. The second was those tools, well, they were very important to the manufacturing process. And it was, they were also very important to uh, saving time making some of these parts. So I want to think about that a little bit today. Um, is there anything that we do as developers that we could save time, that could be easier, that we could be more effective at? And to do that, let's first discuss how linters, compilers, and other cool things work. I'm Will Klein. I'm from Longmont, Colorado. I work in Boulder at, as an engineer at Workday. And today we're going to talk about four things. Uh, first, what are our problems? What are the things that we might be able to think about and improve? Second, I'm going to talk about compilers, because compilers are uh, just really awesome. And typically, you learn, the, learn about that in computer science at, at a university. Um, but I think there's some really essential things that we can all gather very quickly today. And there's a key piece of compilers that we're going to really dive into and make our best friend. And then we're going to look at how that key piece can be applied to those problems and hopefully come up with some solutions. So the first problem that I run into a lot is with code review. And I don't have a problem with code review. I love code review. I've worked in a really lovely code review rich culture for the past five years. Um, but, <clears throat> but there's some things I see in code review that um, could be better. Um, I love getting feedback. I love giving feedback. I love asking questions and learning about code just through the code review. But when something comes up that is, uh, I'll just say, tribal knowledge, uh, I'll submit my first PR to a project. And they'll say, oh, yeah, that's great. But uh, when you work in this part of the code base, there's these other things you can use uh, that you didn't know about. And uh, here's where they are. So there's all these things that we can only learn from code review or from pairing with another developer that I kind of wonder, is, is there a better way than waiting until we get to code review to find out about those things and then going back to the drawing board and re rewriting our code? And the second thing that is actually really awesome are changing language features. We have, since ES6, we have had so many iterations in the language, all these awesome new features that have come about. But I wonder, is there an easier way to apply those to our existing code? Uh, to bring these new awesome things into our code bases and take advantage of them without having to change everything manually. And the last piece is very related to that, API changes, or even changing libraries and frameworks. Um, <laughs> we've seen plenty of change. And I've largely embraced it and enjoyed it. Um, but when I need to switch from one library to another and change all the syntax, so potentially hundreds of changes in the code base, and it's just a lot of tedium. And I wonder, can we also improve that? Cool. So um, to do that, we're going to take a step over to compiler land and talk about compilers really briefly. So how do we turn this into something that the machine can understand? How do we turn a variable declaration into ones and zeros that can be put through the CPU and have awesome things happen in our browsers? It's a little bit of magic, but hopefully less, less of that after today. Uh, Babel. Babel gives us an awesome uh, reference point. Um, Babel is a type of compiler that takes in source, does some stuff with it, and then spits back out JavaScript source. Um, a transpiler, technically, is what type of compiler it is. Um, and it actually has everything we need to, to understand compilers and there's this really awesome definition of a compiler that I'm going to borrow. Uh, Jamie Builds on Twitter and GitHub writes this in the super tiny compiler. Most compilers break down into three primary stages, parsing, transformation, and code generation. OK, let's dive into each one. Parsing is taking raw code, turning it into a more abstract representation of the code. OK. It's taking that JavaScript code and turning it into something else that's more abstract. 
The second part is transformation. That's taking the abstract representation and, and changing it to do whatever the compiler wants it to do. So in the case of Babel, it wants to take potentially JavaScript with ES 2016, 2017, 2018 features, and so on, and do something with that tree so that when it spits it back out, it's going to be in something like closer to ES5 that more browsers can support out of the box. And that's the code generation, is spitting that code back out. And other compilers might spit out something else, but Babel just spits JavaScript back out. Cool, so we're going to focus on one piece of this, the abstract representation, because this is where all the magic that we really care about happens. So going back to our code example, the first thing with parsing that we mentioned is breaking this down into tokens. And it's just what are those discrete pieces of code in this line that stand on their own, the atoms in the molecule? And this is just an array of these tokens. But from here, we need to figure out how to relate these tokens to each other. How does the var and the answer bond to each other? What, are the, what is their connection? And the six and the times and the seven, what, how are they related? And how does that tie back to the variable that's being declared? So to do that, we need some type of representation. That representation is called the AST. And the AST does not stand for whatever Marcy said. It is actually an hard abstract syntax tree. And that sounds very computer science-y and wordy, but um, it's just a tree. Uh, we don't talk about trees a lot in web development, but we actually work with them a ton. The DOM is probably the best example. We have our HTML document, and that has a head and a body. And the head has a title and meta tags, and the, the body has divs, and those divs have their own divs. So what a tree is essentially is just a node at the top it's weird, trees are like upside down in the computer science world. Um, but there's the, the node at the top, there's a root, and then it can have any number of children, and then they can in turn have children. And they can also have properties on them that describe them. So we're going to look at this in a, just another view in a moment. Um, let me show you something called AST Explorer. So this is a really awesome tool that's up at astexplorer.net. Um, check it out. We're going to play with it today and show you how it works. Um, it's a little bit tricky to present with, though. There's a lot of options, and it doesn't quite scale very well. So I made a special version, a Cascadia JS edition. Cool. So right here, we just have an empty program, a file. It's the same thing. And there's nothing here, but already we have a tree. And right off, we can see that it has a program node. This is the root node in every program, every file that's, that's parsed. And it has three types of properties that we're going to talk about. The first is its type. And every, every node always has a type, and this will differ. Um, program at the top here. And the second type of property is where the children can live. In this case, there's a body. There's nothing there yet, but there will be. And the third type is a descriptive property uh, describing that node itself. Uh, in this case, it's describing it as a source type of module. All right, let's look at another example. Let's look at those variables again. So now we can see that the program has two children. It has two elements here. If we expand that, they are two variable declarations. ASCs are awesome, and Cascadia JS is love. So the first variable declaration, there's a little bit of a hint here say, in the gray saying, hey, it has a type, it has declarations, and it has kind. So the type we're familiar with the declarations, this is what the children look like on a variable declaration. There could be more than ones. So there's just one here. Um, it also has a kind. And the kind is kind of cool, because it's describing whether it's a const, or a let, or just a var. That looks pretty familiar. Let's dive deeper down the rabbit hole for a moment. Looking at the variable declarator, this has two properties besides the type. It has an ID and an init. It doesn't have any descriptive properties, but it's got two places where its children live. It's good. It has its identifier for ASTs, and then it initializes that to this string little for awesome. So every node in the AST for JavaScript looks like this. The node type might be a little bit different. Its children might live in a different place, or it might not have children, and it might have different descriptive properties. But every node in JavaScript in the AST can be related to this example. Let's take it one step further. So I was talking about uh, automating code reviews before. Who here has seen code like this? Who has seen code like this on one line? 
Yeah, that's a lot of hands. Um, yeah, so tools like ESLint are great for this, to look for patterns in the language um, and help us, uh, <laughs> help us uh, warn us when we're doing things we probably shouldn't. Um, we're going to write an ESLint role for this. So I'm going to go over to Transform on the ASC Explorer and pull up the latest version of ESLint. And let me explain this for a moment. So every ESLint rule is essentially a function. This function returns an object. This object is where you can say, hey, whenever there's a node of a given type, I care about that. And whenever you find it, ESLint, pass that into my function here. So this um, example is looking for template literals. We don't have any. Um, what do we care about here? Uh, let me go back to the Explorer. Uh, if I click here, cool. So I see conditional expression a bunch of times. Pretty sure that that's what ternaries are called. So that's the type. So let's grab that. And let's yell if anyone uses a ternary. Cool. So over on this bottom right, we see that it's, hey, you have a ternary here, you have a ternary here, we have three ternaries. Awesome. Cool. I don't hate ternaries that much. I think they're great when they're appropriate and they're just a single one. Um, so let's narrow this down. And every ESLint rule will do this. They'll say, hey, I care about this node type, but I'm going to look for a pattern. And so what do we need to look for? So we talked about it being nested, and that's where the, the, node is, the node of the same type is on the, uh, on the child. And there's three things on this node. There's the test. This is the condition it executes. And if that condition is truthy, it returns the consequent. If it's falsely, it returns the alternate. These consequents and these alternates, these are the children we care about. And these are the ones that have that nested type. So, oh Lord, what happened to the bottom? There it is, okay. <laughs> so let's grab that. Uh, we need to write a check. Just a little bit of logic here. So we need to look at the node and look at its consequent and check its type. And if it equals a conditional expression, or if, I'm going to copy this, if that alternate is a conditional expression. It's a little bit smaller. Oh, Lord, don't, 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 don't leave. <laughs> Live code is all going wrong. Uh, it's fine. I'll just give it a quick reload. It is crashing hard. Uh, cool. Let me make this bigger again. Cool. So I just have to fix a little bit of code here. My cursor is like not where I think it is. Turn off prettier. There it goes. Oh. Yeah, this is not because of ACExplorer.net. This is because I hacked this like in the past week instead of working on my presentation uh, at like the wrong hours of the day. Cool. So, <laughs> so now we're looking for a conditional expression on either of the children. And now it's only warning us about one thing. And this is actually, in fact, the ESLint rule for nested ternaries. Let's look at one more example. Let's look at transforms. So focus up here for a minute. And we have two objects. They're essentially the same. When you have the key and the value as the, the same thing, in this case, x, they can be represented as x colon x, or in a shorthand version, that's just x. Uh, super convenient. Uh, what I would like to do is try to implement the Babel transform that would make uh, this first one with the shorthand output the same. So we want to change this part in the bottom right. If we look at a Babel transform, the boilerplate is a little bit different. Um, there's a function that returns an object again, but that object has a name and a visitor. This visitor is actually the same as that object in ESLint. Um, so we're going to dive into that. It cares about an identifier right now in the boilerplate. It's reversing the, uh, the identifiers, making them backwards. That's funny. Uh, so let's change that to be, uh, what do we need it to be? So if we look at x, holy lord, try this again. Oh, we got this. I've never seen this happen. Of course it's live. Uh, so if I look at this, we've got an object expression. This is the object itself. It's got properties. Okay. The properties, the object property has a shorthand value. This is the descriptive property that we care about, and it's false right now. So what do we need to do? We first need to care about object properties. Turn off prettier. Uh, we first need to care about object properties. And then when we run into them, 
we need to do something with that node. So that node has a shorthand value, and we can just set it to be false. So it was, it was true before on the other one, and now we're changing it to false. Now the output matches. Um, there's one more thing. We don't want to do this for, oh my lord. Um, we don't want to do this for, for every node. So what we normally do is just do an if check and check the path.node.shorthand if it's truthy. Only then mutate the tree. Uh, cool. All right. So that is actually the, all there is to the object property or the object shorthand property transform in Babel. And this is a plugin in the ESLint, uh, not the ESLint, the Babel uh, plugin source code. Um, I'll stop here for a moment because this concept of transforming the tree and outputting something else also applies to another tool called code mods. What code mods are is taking in some syntax and changing it to some updated syntax. So we talked about new, new features in JavaScript and we talked about API changes and changing libraries and frameworks. We could do transforms like this to take old syntax that we want to update and automate the conversion across our code base to the newer syntax. There's one more thing I'll point you to. Uh, it's this website that just put up yesterday called astsareawesome.com, and it has full background of everything we've been talking about uh, with links to examples, uh, super tiny compilers in there, and some other things. So check it out after this uh, for more information. Cool. So I know we all heard Neo say in the Matrix, I know Kung Fu. But if Neo's a programmer, and the Matrix is essentially made of code, and he's bending the Matrix to his will, what I think he really meant to say is, I know some really sick AST transforms. <laughs> Try it. Pull up astexplorer.net and start typing code. Paste stuff from, from your project and see what it looks like. And the next time you're in code review and you see something like, oh, I need to tell you about this thing that you couldn't otherwise know about, um, think about whether that, was, that can be discerned, uh, filtered down into a pattern that you can automate, that you can write an ESLint rule for. Uh, here's actually uh, the first ESLint rule I wrote was for this code. Uh, we had this API request function that would get data from the server. And it had um, a way of saying how many records it wanted to retrieve. You know, maybe like 50 or 100, something reasonable. But we had cases in our code base that looked past an account of infinity, which would get all the records. And that sounds OK, right? Um, except users with lots of data, you know, our big customers that love us so much, um, they would make this request on a, in the browser, and it would take forever. And after three seconds, it would time out, and they would just get a really bad screen that didn't help them at all. Um, so we, we needed to fix this. But we had something like 60 plus developers in the front end code across all the teams. And this was like, it, it, it kept popping up here and there. Um, and we could tell everyone, but like, how do you just like tell everyone and then tell the new person all that? So we automated this. So we wrote an ESLint rule that looked for any invocations to API.request and looked at the parameters passed in and then looked at that, that configuration object and looked at the count and made sure it was something reasonable. And if it was something crazy like infinity, we would uh, warn them nicely before code review. Let's talk about API changes. Can we automate those? Um, we had been using Glamorous in a project that I'm on now. And this is basically styled components, CSS and JS. It actually, it's quite great lately. Um, and Ken C. Dodds, he, we talked about him yesterday, he worked on this. And he was the first to say, hey, everyone, Glamorous is, uh, Glamorous is great, but Motion's even better. We should just deprecate and move to that. So we have lots of CSS, lots of components. We've got to change everything in our code base. Um, and it looks something like this. Um, this is just uh, Glamorous takes in some, some CSS and, and generates uh, an element with that style applied. We needed to change the syntax from using Glamorous to using styled. And instead of taking an object in, it needed to be passed a string literal, which is great, because then you can just write real CSS and not like JavaScriptify it. Turned out there was a community effort um, to transform all the instances of Glamorous to Emotion. We applied this in our code base and changed hundreds of lines in just a click of a button, and it was fantastic. 
Cool. Let me tell you one more story. Um, I was at a JSConf uh, in Florida, JSConf US 2015, and there was a young developer that got on stage and he was telling his story. And it was something like this. There was this new thing called ES6. There was a large gap in my knowledge on parsers, compilers, and generally the intricacies of JavaScript. So I decided to make an ES6 transpiler to learn it, called 6 to 5. This was Sebastian McKenzie, and 6 to 5 is now known as Babel. Now, I am not encouraging you all to go out and write your own compiler. We don't need to. But given Babel, given ESLint, uh, given some libraries for code mods, and given equivalents in, in TypeScript, we don't have to. We can build plugins for these tools. We can write our own linting plugins that look like what I showed you. We can write transforms that can update our code. We can harness the AST. And I encourage everyone here, this is something for you to try. Um, I'm, I'm here to answer questions on the internet or after this. Um, I encourage you all to build your own tools to help you and to help everyone else that writes JavaScript be more effective JavaScript developers. My name is Will Klein. I'm on Twitter at Will's Lab. Thank you very much. <laughs>